All right, so, so uh, let, let's just get underway with uh, maybe a little bit of uh, conversation about your time at the University of Miami. Uh, what was it like coming from Guyana in uh, the late 80s? Uh, how did you come to choose Miami uh, as your uh, place of study? And uh, uh, what turned you on to economics? So I'll take all of them yeah. at once. Make, am I, is this? Yes. So my, I was born, as was said, and raised in Guyana, South America. And at the time I was contemplating my college choice, Guyana was a socialist country. It's no longer socialist, but it was at the time. Uh, to the extent that, that students went abroad to study, many did not. Most of them studied in what was then called the Eastern Bloc. Many of them did. So my classmates studied in East Germany, or they studied in what was then called Czechoslovakia, and many studied in Cuba. My father and mother had done courses here at the University of Miami years before. And, um, and so there was a vague, there was a connection. Yeah. I was telling a story about um, a, 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 a library in my country, uh, the John F. Kennedy Library, it was called. And it was established in the 1960s. Many such establishments were created in the, what was called then the developing world with the idea of exposing uh, persons or societies fresh out of colonialism to the American idea, if, if you will. I was a regular attendant to that place. I went there all the time. I was a big sports fan then and now. And I would go to read Sports Illustrated, which I devoured um, two years, three years in the past. I met a man there who said, you know, you, you should think about studying in the States and so on. You heard about the SAT, he said. Not really. Um, and with their encouragement, I took the SAT and then applied to Miami. And I received here uh, a scholarship without which I could not, forget about attending, I couldn't get into the country. One needed to demonstrate financial ability to attend. I received what was called a Sanford scholarship, I believe. And then shortly thereafter, I got, once I came here, I was made an RA in Pearson Hall, where I lived. Um, Miami was, for me, many things. There was first, the first direct exposure to what, for me, was the West in all of its wealth. Um, it struck me as an ex ex extraordinarily luxurious and well-resourced, uh, rich society. So there was the collision with what was unfamiliar to me that was jarring in some way. It was also true, though, that I felt from the very beginning a certain acceptance here. I felt um, comfortable here. I felt um, welcomed. You know, my, my friends in the dorm came from dramatically different places than did I. My friend Jason Kimmel, I remember his name, uh, was, from, was from New Jersey, something. And he introduced me to music I hadn't heard before. You know, I introduced him to Bob Marley, and he introduced me to Steely Dan, which I didn't know and still love. You know, we listen to Eagles a lot. You know. um, uh, and there were many, many other friends. I stumbled into economics. I came here as a, I was going to be a mathematics major, and my plan was to complete my mathematics study and go to medical school. That was more my mother's plan than mine. Um, I stumbled into an economics class. And it was fine. But with each passing day, I liked it more and more. I don't remember whether it was my first class or my second, but I had the good fortune to be in a class of Professor Phil Robbins, who's here. And I have said publicly in many settings that the experience changed my life's direction. I remember vividly sitting in the class and thinking, I don't want to do anything else. Um, and I haven't done anything else. <laughs> I haven't had a job since. Right. <laughs> what, what, what is it about economics that intrigued you? Uh, coming as I did from a society that was not rich, but was full of loving and intelligent and brilliant people, lots of natural resources, bauxite, and, uh, and fisheries and timber, and so on like that, um, where it was a very racially heterogeneous society. Uh, we, there were these, the, the makings of success. What prevented it, I often wondered, from the wealth I saw in other places? What is it that caused 
some societies to grow rich. Uh, that was one class question. I also have been very interested my life long in um, how humans interact. How is it one group decides to become owners? What is it when, when someone uh, hires a worker? What goes into that decision? How does production occur? That kind of thing. I wouldn't have had these names for it. Yes. They would have been ideas that floated around in my mind. What economics did for me from the very beginning was to take that seeming disorder and organize it. Yeah? Oh, I see. I see. They're incentive. I see. There's an objective function. There's equilibrium. I get that. I see where that's going, you see? And it allowed me to make sense of questions that long interested me. As is true with anything that one studies in a scholarly way, more questions emerge as, an, as one gets answers, you see? So I answer, oh, I know how to do that now. I know how to optimize, kind of like that. Yeah. I see, but suppose the budget set, because I know what that is now, right? Suppose the budget set isn't smooth, yeah? Well, you see, and other questions unfold. As you look back over the last, say, 40 years in economics, what, what are the two or three most important contributions that have been made to the science, if I can use that word, of economics? That's interesting. Let me say two. Okay. Um, one is close to my area, my specialization, and my style of study. And that is the, the growth across economics of rigorous quantification and transparent identification. By which I mean, someone wishes to assess the effect of X on Y. That question has bedeviled economists and social scientists forever. But there was a certain opaqueness, a certain impenetrable complexity to how one got at the question. I think over the last several years, any economist, indeed, it is not only economists, but I'll focus on the field I know, seeking to answer that question, thinks to herself, well, what is varying with what? Yeah? And, and I believe that thing is varying, but is it coincidentally varying some other thing? A confound, kind of like that. How would I clean that up? Kind of thing. The obsession the field has had with making its empirical methodology more transparent and therefore more convincing uh, is, I think, uh, major innovation number one. Closely allied with it is that in order to do this kind of thing, in order to do, for example, a regression discontinuity, the economists and others in the room know what I mean. Yeah? What happens just at the threshold and just below the threshold. If one thinks about that, in order to do that, one needs lots of data around the threshold. Otherwise, the whole exercise is fraud from the beginning. So it's not only that our methods have become more transparent, more rigorous, more lucid, more convincing, but the data that we bring to the enterprise has dramatically altered what we do and the quality of what we do. That's related to the transparent empirical methodologies. I would say, and then there's a final one, that is somewhat at a remove from what I do, but not wholly so. And that is the uh, homo economicus, we say. Economists write down models in which we represent a kind of stick figure representation of reality. We're not embarrassed about that, you see. Someone says that the model isn't exactly reflective of reality. I say, well, of course that's true. We didn't expect it to be, you see. Um, we're writing down a stick figure. And a stick figure, we're trying to get as far as we can with, with as few encumbrances as possible. So we're going to assume that people know what they want, for example. And we're going to assume that they will take actions that get them closer to what they want. And that they are prevented from getting nearby the thing we call constraints, kind of like that. Notice in that, I didn't say, how do people get to know what they want? How do people get to feel about themselves? What gives rise to preferences? What, what does psychology have to say about how an agent sees herself? Yeah? An agent's constraint. Smith knew this. Adam Smith. Um, there is the formal, the, the formal representation of the relation of some objective function to some constraint we can write down, but there are more nebulous 
and maybe not, not despite their being nebulous, equally important constructs. Yeah? Like how do I live as an individual in this context? Yeah? I'm not saying that we have nailed that. But if one looks at the field that's called behavioral economics, for example, and the insights being brought into my field from psychology, from aspects of narrative sociology, from history, this to me is a profound innovation in the field and a good one. Those are three things. How, how did uh, your experience here as an undergraduate uh, influence what you then focused on from a disciplinary point of view within economics and maybe perhaps even influenced uh, the thesis that you uh, wrote for your PhD? Um, it was not that direct a link, frankly. It was not. It was more that interest in a certain way of looking at the world and seeking to answer questions that was enkindled here. It was not, I write on lots of different things. Um, still. Yes. Right? Um, and what is it that causes me to write on a topic? I am puzzled by the answers I see, or the absence of answers. Why is it that people don't know this thing? Or why is this thing that people say they know so self-evidently incomplete or wrong? Yeah? Yes. Can I make headway here? How would one make headway? Yeah. What tools would I bring to that enterprise? I have a very limited set of tools, and I employ them carefully. But I, the questions were not linked directly to my experience here, with an exception. Much of my work has to do with, not all of it, but a good chunk of my work has to do with equilibrium, racial, and gender outcomes in a market economy. In some ways, the fact that putatively irrelevant traits, like the fact that someone has slightly more, or maybe much more, melanin skin color than another person, or someone has different hair type, or someone's a woman, and that in the way we teach or think about economics is that the market, the firm doing the hiring, cares not at all or ought not to care about the container mm -hmm. in which skills are held. Mm -hmm. You see, the firm ought to care about productivity. Can this person make widgets, write papers, teach, kind of like that? But as we look around us, we see evidence all around that these obviously irrelevant traits matter hugely. Yeah? Why? How can that be? How in equilibrium can this survive? Kind of like that. Thinking of that question the way I just described began here. And it began in Professor Robbins's class, actually. Um, and much of my work has gone and jumped off in other directions. But that is one direct link to my, my, um, my crew in, in embryonic form when I was a baby economist. Yeah. So uh, your range has been very broad. Um, I think it might be interesting for you to perhaps just uh, pick out two or three papers that, when you look back, were formative in your evolution as a scholar, but also perhaps separately, or it could be in parallel, significant in their impact. And these are, uh, so did you mean by that papers that I myself have authored? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah. so, um, so it is not exactly the, the case that papers are like one's children <laughs> about whom, towards whom one exhibits or ought to exhibit equal yeah. Yeah, yeah. adoration. Yeah? <laughs> it's not exactly like that, but it's close. Um, every paper uh, comes about after long, long nights, deep frustration, the thing not running right, you know, you coded it, everything. And so every time one is published, there is, there is a sense of overwhelming elation mm -hmm. that that is done. Kind of so in that sense, I love them all the same. Yeah? But there are a couple of papers that, uh, so I wrote a paper many years ago about the role of prejudice in equilibrium wage differences. And it follows on a very famous paper by Gary Becker, who's an intellectual hero of mine, in which he posited that the thing called discrimination could itself be linked 
to something called prejudice. Notice you do the distinction between two. Yes. Discrimination is a market realization of a differential. Yes. Yes. I observed that women are not promoted the same way men are. That's discrimination. Prejudice is the, the set of, of latent, latent to the world sentiment that inform the discriminatory conduct. And Becker said, look, look, maybe, he said, um, a feature of a discriminatory market is that agents will, in equilibrium, act so as to sort themselves away from, away from the prejudice. Imagine an agent looking for an apartment. The last place she will look is a place where she heard they're discriminating against, mm -hmm. you see? And so, the, moreover, the person with the preference, with the latent preference, is himself trying to avoid the group he despises. Yeah. That has an equilibrium implication that's subtle. It implies that in equilibrium, it ought to be the case that the gap we observe in wages, employment, promotion should be related not to the mean prejudice in a market, not to the mean, but depending on the group, to the marginal, he said. And if the group is, say, 10% of the population, what that implies is that it is the prejudice of the 10th percentile that matters, not mm -hmm. the median. Uh -huh. I read that many years ago, and it stuck in my mind. It stuck in my mind. I couldn't get rid of it. And so I thought, I'm going to write a paper about that. I'm going to wait until I can get the data to get this thing convincingly into it. And I wrote it with my dear friend, John Gorian. Um, that's a paper of ours in the JP. That's a paper I, I absolutely love. Yeah. So that's one paper. Um, I don't want to take up. I can go on. Maybe just a little bit uh, more before we get into business school uh, strategy, et cetera. Maybe a little bit more on the uh, public health Yes. interests that you have because here at uh, the University of Miami we have a strong uh, health management group and uh, no. the university is uh, well reputed in this indeed, area. Indeed. Right. And so I didn't take courses mm -hmm. in health or public health when I was here but I knew of university strength. Uh, the medical school was then incredibly strong and remains so um, so there was always this interest in health vague at the side. How does a paper come to be? Uh, one of my dearest friends, my friend Dan Reese, with whom I went to graduate school, and I would talk periodically about health and public health, like the origins of public health interventions. And uh, I was curious about that. Like, how did, how did we deal with, with I don't know, uh, tuberculosis? Yeah. And I said, you know, we could collect data about that. We could dig into the archives. And Dan Rees and Mark Anderson and I have done that in a series of papers over the last five years. I, in the last five, four or five years, I've written eight papers. I would have never thought that. Um, and these range from re-examination of, uh, say, the licensing rules that govern mid midwifery. That's a paper I've never thought I would write. That's a JP paper from a couple of years ago. I have papers about water quality and maternal health. Papers about, you do so? And so as I do one thing, I discovered, wait, when they were talking about water quality, the, the next thing they were thinking about, or simultaneous with the water quality interventions, were things about milk quality. How do we pasteurize? How do we, and so I started looking into that, you know, and that's gonna be a paper of ours in the, by the summer. Um, and it's become thinking about the historical route of public health interventions has become one of my main research areas over the last few years. And when I began, I would not have known that we would be living through a global pandemic. Yeah? And so, fortune, fate, whatever. All right. Uh, so the economics department of Miami Herbert Business School, uh, or of the university, lies within Miami Herbert yep. Business School. Um, to me, that's an advantage. I wonder if you see it the same way. And of course, you have the Department of Economics separate from the Yale School of Management. Yes. Um, is there a preferred method of bringing the best of economics to uh, MBA programs? It's a good question. It's, it's not obvious what the right approach is. Uh, let me speak first from the perspective of a student in an MBA program. What is the benefit of having an economics department in-house? 
one of the main advantages of professional education, like MBA, is that the student, whatever her interest, learns to see the problem from a different vantage point. She's sourcing and managing funds, she believes, in finance, let's say. And in so doing, she writes, well, how do different financial institutions come to be? How do they respond to regulation? You see, they're right adjacent to the thing that is her narrow interest. There's a set of questions that touch upon it. When an economics department is housed within a, within a business school, it is easier, it is natural for the student to stray across those disciplinary boundaries. There is more uh, meaningful interaction across scholars that strictly benefits it. Economists are, are nudged to ask slightly different kinds of questions. When one is talking to one's colleagues in accounting, yeah? or in organizational behavior, or in finance, the set of things that occur to one is slightly different. Slightly different, yeah? And more relevant, I believe. One of the complaints that people level against all academics, this is not just economics, but all academics, is the unfair criticism that uh, you are disconnected from the real world, something like that. This is an unfair criticism. All of us are motivated by questions about the real world. But fine, let, let's take the criticism. One nice thing about being in a business school is that there is no distance in the real world. The students come in with experiences. The students come in with an urgent desire to apply the things they're learning year after next, or next month, practically. Yeah? And so that makes economics more vibrantly relevant. It's not only economics, but it's all fields. But I speak about economics from my particular vantage point. I don't know if there are any other fields in business schools. There must be, that have as large a presence outside of business schools. Business law. Yeah, business law. But um, the fact that economics sits across multiple places is, I think, a strength of the field. And it makes the instruction that goes on within the MBA program better than would otherwise be true. Okay. Um, the Yale School of Management is not the Yale Business School Correct. for a very good set of reasons. And it might be interesting to uh, the audience to hear a little bit about the history of how that came about and today how you and your colleagues collectively uphold the uh, vision of, of the founders. So the Yale School of Management, this is called, SOM. Um, so the Harvard Business School, for example, is an old thing. I forget when Harvard was founded. Yale did not have a business school. And there was some debate about whether to do it. The concern is, or was, that, look, is it, we, we want people to be interested in um, I, want to be, I don't want to be unfair. It wasn't that people thought that practical analysis was inappropriate. But th there was something about the sort of a narrow focus on immediate application to business that gave some people pause. It was decided that, fine, it's not business. We are teaching in this school when it is founded certain principles, principles broadly applicable across contexts. These principles and the students who acquire them while they're here should help transform humanity for the better. That transformation might occur through business, but not necessarily. It might occur in the public sphere. It might occur in the nonprofit sector. If you want to run a museum, what do you have to do? There are budgets, yeah? There's advertising, because you have your museum, what's her name across the way as an art center, yeah? There's fundraising, how does one do that? How do, you see. There's a staff. How does one get them committed to the values that call like that? You will notice that the things I said could it just as well be about running Cisco, yeah? And so the Yale School of Management was founded on the notion that it will be providing the skills I just described for use across a broad swath of society, across business, the public sector, and nonprofit sector with the aim of producing this business school, leaders for business and society at this school. So that is the founding mission that animated the school. A question one might ask is about 
the contemporary relevance of the founding mission. In my view, it is more relevant than ever. And in some ways, it's relevant not only at Yale. I cannot conceive of a societal problem of profound significance that will be resolved without active business engagement. Pick, pick a one. You say to me, we're concerned about climate change. Fair enough. I hear you. Climate change is driven by lots of things. It's driven by large-scale agriculture and, and cow production. It's driven by the fact that, that companies must deliver their goods transcontinentally on airlines. Yeah? It's driven by coal production. That got, you see? And so for hay way to be made on that, business will have to be modified. If we do it using, say, trading permits, the insights about how permits are to be conducted is a business idea. This notion runs in the reverse as well. Not only is business essential for the resolution of certain problems, if you look around us, many, many problems that bedevil the society have their origins in business increasingly. What do I mean? Take addiction. Take addiction. So if one were talking about addiction in 1968, 70, it was a scourge. If we were worried about the use of marijuana and heroin after the Vietnam War, or during the Vietnam War, what is the addiction issue we talk about today? The addiction issue that most worries us is oxycodone. We're most worried about uh, agents being addicted to a legally produced drug, produced for palliative care. That, you see, you see, that addiction concern, whereas once before, it was about the illegal importation of an illegal narcotic. We're not talking about that now. Now we're talking about something created to solve a human concern or problem. Its overuse has created problems. Privacy. In the 1920s and 30s, one was worried about the government reading one's, reading one's mail. Yeah? Reading one's mail or cracking up one's mailbox, this kind of thing. If you talk to a 25 year old person, what are you worried about now? She wonders if I send you an Insta post thing, you know, thing, does it survive? If I send my girlfriend a text, does my mom see it? Do you see? The privacy concern now rests within business in a large As we look across the landscape, I can give many other examples, that this thing that many of the concerns and problems we have arise within business, one final one, inequality, socioeconomic earnings inequality. That's contributed to by many things. Historically, one source has been pre-market. And so there are areas in the country in which um, youngsters did not receive the education they deserved. As a consequence, the labor market hiring these youngsters privileged some and not the others because some could do math, but you can't like that. That still exists. But increasingly, a major source of inequality occurs within firms. Now, <laughs> the firm driver, the firm's role in wage spread, in promotion different, and all of it, is becoming ever larger. And so this is not to deny the importance of pre-market drivers, but to the extent that they're market drivers, they're increasingly occurring within firms. And so whatever we look, wherever we look, the kind of spirit that animated SOM's founding, and that I believe informs what lots of business schools seek to do, even if they don't name it the same thing, is more relevant now than ever. What would be the uh, three principal agenda goals you have for uh, SOM? Oh, okay. God. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's a tough one. Um, what would be the three main things? Um, we, this is an SOM specific point. We must revivify our, our, our motto and values and mission. It's got to be the case that if SOM's mission, its distinctive stated mission, training leaders for business and society, is as important to us as we, as we argue, one should see evidence of that everywhere. Yes. 
One should see evidence of it in the courses we teach. In the examples, we pick the cases we focus on. That indeed, if that is not true, then it gives a lie to the claim that the motto meant. So across the school, I want to see the mission reinvigorated over my course as dean. This is not to say that other deans were inattentive to that. It is one of my foci to make it more important, more than it, than it used to be. Second, we are, this is true of all higher institutions, higher, we are, I would like our school to be more broadly representative of the society that it's going to serve. That must be true both among the professoriate and among the students. It must be true. That would be true even if we did not have the mission we have. We do have the mission we have. So I look around the school. I look around the faculty gathering. I meet the students at welcoming. I want them to look like the country they're going to lead. You see? Not exactly like it, yeah? But it must be more broadly representative yeah? than is now true. Finally, I think this thing is an ambition shared with leaders of every school. It is my firm conviction that the most enduring thing, the most important thing, that universities do is to produce frontier knowledge. It's the one imperishable thing. And our ambitions regarding scholarship, relevance, path breaking, etc., even at Yale, should always be grander still. Always be grander still. Always. We must be reaching beyond the boundary of area. We're great in whatever thing, let's be greater still. I would like over the course of my deanship for there to be a feeling around the school that alongside our good teaching and service, dedication to our mission being more representative, we are endlessly, vigorously, maniacally seeking scholarly excellence. Uh, what, can you bring those three um, thoughts to a comment around what the MBA program should look like five years from now. Wow, this is a, this is a very difficult one. And I know it's one that every leader is grappling with. I'm not ducking the question. I don't duck questions. I genuinely don't know. Let me give you some. some. So during COVID, all of us went remote, hybrid. We all went hybrid. Professors taught thing, and the students run the thing, and so on like that. And something was lost. There's no question about that. People come to, to business school and professional training, not only to acquire the information imparted in a classroom setting, but because of the interactions that occur outside of class, the co-curricular things that are so vital. I pitch my idea to my friend, kind of like that. When I'm not in physical proximity to my friend, I don't, the pitching, the conversation, the argument, the debate the, is not the same. Good. Good. So something was wrong. But there were things that we learned. For example, for example, we are constrained now by the design and scale of our classrooms. Every dean knows that there is some person who's an amazing intro finance teacher. We know, yeah? But my intro finance, my intro economic, my intro accounting teacher cannot teach everybody, you know what? Because the building is constrained. Yeah? And so she can teach 50, 100, 150. Why? There, as I look five, 10 years down the line, the idea that pedagogy, the instructional part of schooling, of teaching, will occur exclusively in a format recognizable to, say, Socrates, right? of, of someone standing before a group of younger people, let, yeah? 
that that will be the exclusive way that instruction occurs seems to me incredibly unlikely. But how to do that in a way that preserves what is essential about this? When I said I'm not coming back to my alma mater on Zoom, you see? I want to smell the thing. I want to see the, uh, you see, like that. Students feel that too. We haven't figured that out exactly. How quanty should our students be? I don't know. <laughs> we, time is fixed. How, how adept should they be at manipulating the large data set? Do they need all to be? As we increase courses there, we must necessarily cut them elsewhere. Come on. What international experiences should our students have? Um, I can go on to highlight that there are many questions that are out there unresolved. It's not obvious that we will all settle on the same answer. And that might be fine. It might be that some schools of management or business are exclusively residential. That would be fine. And there are others that are exclusively online. And there's some continuum in between. But we're figuring this out as we go. I think we're in a moment of profound transformation, or one is looming, I believe. And so I'm not ducking the question. But I'm saying my clairvoyance on this matter is just as bad as everyone else's. All right. So I, th I think we've got uh, maybe uh, 15 minutes for some uh, Q&A from the audience. So I, I think we have a roving mic here. So uh, please uh, fire away and uh, maybe introduce yourself uh, first and then ask a brief question so we can get as many in as possible. Please. Thank you. Um, my name is Francisco Sibalste. Um, I was actually an MBA student here. Yeah. Um, and I come from the world of media specifically. I would like to thank one of the pioneers in what is today called streaming, although I was doing streaming for Bloomberg since 1997. But the question is, don't you feel, I'm an immigrant as well from Latin America, and I have many friends, if I can do a project with 16 countries on Western Africa right now, but don't you feel that by creating perhaps a hybrid MBA or a, a business program of some sort, or management program, and including people from all parts of, uh, and even regional parts of the world, Africa, mm -hmm. Latin America, by country, you can bring in the enrichment that all of these people aspire from a U.S. education, while at the same time bringing them together in their country of origin and for them to be exchanging the experience of the U.S., but in their own countries, staying in their countries and enriching their own countries. Yes. You know? Yeah, I think this is an important point, that another thing we do, ideally, whereby we, I mean all of us, we're all engaged in the same activity. We are instructing. We are passing on to the next generation the best there is to know, what open questions are, etc. We are doing research. We're generating new ideas and so forth. And we are disseminating to the broader world the fruits of our inquiry, of our joint conversation, that if all we produce and discuss rests within the walls of our institutions, then great universities will have failed in an important aspect of their mission, in my view. Your question says, can't we take advantage of these emerging technologies so that some kid, or maybe not a kid, yeah, maybe is a retiree wanting to learn a new thing, yeah, can sign up for one of the many excellent courses here in her country with a couple of other people. And I have already stipulated that there is some loss from not being in person. I've established that. But it seems to me that we will and must take advantage of the technologies now available to help serve the dissemination function that is so essential to us all. There's another thing. There is the, by so doing, we will help erode idiotic differences xenophobia, regionalism, uh, tribalism, 
that's one of the plagues of humankind. That when a kid gets to see someone talking about something that excites him, someone very different from him. Yeah. He's in a class, joint on a Zoom with a nut. Yeah. Then he feels differently about the world and its possibilities and about his, the people who inhabit the world with him, you see. You see. So I think we have to do it sensibly, can't be careless. We have to retain what's essential and important about us. But I think it's something we are all called upon to think creatively to address. All right, thank you. The lady uh, towards the back, yes, please. Hello everyone, my name is Dominique. I am an econ and math major here at UM. Yay. <laughs> yeah, hey, um, And I, I had, I'm also from Jamaica. I came to UM um, for my freshman year. Um, so I had a question for you. As I go on, I'm going into a PhD program in economics, and I, as, as we go on and we gain all this information and we make contributions towards the field of economics, how do you make sure that you're always thinking back to your home country? Uh, so we have a lot in common, right? math and econ, myself. I'm from Guyana, as I've said. Look, you touch on something that I really, you know, I, I think about. Right? That, um, so I am here talking with you, and I teach at Yale. And before that, I was at Chicago and Michigan and so forth. W would not my efforts have been better, in a sense I'll describe in a second, spent in the country that, in, where I'm from, that in principle needs um, whatever modest talents I have, kind of like that. I think every immigrant who comes and stays grapples with this. I will tell you what I've said to myself. And you might say, Kerwin, it's, what, it's a story you tell yourself. Fair enough. Let me tell you the story I tell myself. The story I tell myself is that um, I am able to do better work. I'm able to be more impactful. I'm able to be a better example to the extent that I'm an example at all. I'm able to, to inspire, however modestly. I'm better able to do that by virtue of opportunities present here that would not be present, would not certainly have been present as I was coming along. As the world becomes flatter, smaller, I get letters from or notes from kids, you know, in the Caribbean or somebody might buy from Africa or something. And I feel that maybe I would not have, I certainly wouldn't have written the same number of papers. I wouldn't have met the same kind of scholar. And so it's a difficult thing. It is something that as you go on in your career, you'll have to confront. Others make the opposite choice. Dear friends of mine have said I'm going home. And I, I understand. But the story I tell myself, the story I actually believe, is what I just outlined. And whichever path you choose, whichever path you choose, will be the right one for you. There's no wrong choice here. All right, thank you for that wisdom. And uh, do we have a couple more questions? And uh, uh, yes. Michael. Hi, I'm Michael French. Uh, and uh, I have a question about your personal objective function and uh, budget constraint when it comes to all of the things you're involved in. You're a research active administrator. And Professor Mortensen tells me you're a terrific teacher as well. How do you balance all those, and what are the choices that you have to make and give up certain things that you really love doing? Okay. So, um, so as a professor, if everyone here knows it, one's a professor. So what's one doing? You know, you're working all the time, but it's not. As I said earlier, it's not real work, in the sense that. You love it so, you know? You love it so. It's not, it's not work. You know, I've spent, I've spent weeks of my life on an abstract. It's just crazy when you think about it. Like, an abstract. To get it to the 150 words, or 100 words, or like that. It's not work. 
As a professor, one is blessed with these moments of dead time. The summer comes, yeah? Christmas break, yeah? Spring break. And during those times, one has a certain blue sky freedom. You know, you, you just read anything. You lean back, you listen to music, you go to some crazy, kind of like that. And ideas are spawned. Yeah? Things come together suddenly when you're lying looking at the sky, kind of thing. You become an administrator, and life becomes more regimented. The big thing I had to give up was the blue sky. Yeah? That kind of, you know, I'm going to have a month to just gaze through all these hues of Jolie, of, that's gone, yeah? But it's also made me more disciplined. I am much more aware of time I wasted as a professor. Like, why am I talking to my co-author for an hour and a half? Why? Like, half the time we're talking about the score of the game, what happened with the kid. The, you know? Now when I'm talking to my co-author, we have 45 minutes. And we're, student wants to come and chat. I always want to talk to students. Um, it's le there's less meandering. Yeah, we're going to talk. And so there is giving up and gaining. I've given up the freedom. I've given up as the, not just the freedom, the amount of time I had to think about scholarship. But I've gained a certain discipline, a certain shaving off of the irrelevant, a certain uh, promptness in quickly killing the idea that's not going anywhere. Everyone in this room, everybody here, has spent way too much time on a paper that's going nowhere. I have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You become an administrator, you have to kill that paper. Yeah. There's a certain intellectual ruthlessness that comes with it, and I like it. Yeah. I like it a lot. The other thing I've gained is a certain broader purview of what it is we are all doing. And I delight in the feeling that I'm enabling other people. Yeah, that I talk to someone and God, they want to know how they can get their data set, or do I know what's his name? Or what? Yeah. And as a professor, I would do it, but it was a secondary thing. But now it's part of my job, and I like it very much. As a professor, you write a paper, even one's best placed paper. Who? Who reads this paper? Yeah, a couple hundred people, man. And your mom. Yeah. She doesn't even read the whole thing. She just gets the title. As an administrator, one gets to meet people who are doing things in the world. Uh, one gets to meet people who have achieved success and dealt with failure in different activities, different spheres of endeavor. And that can be hugely uh, invigorating and educational. I've met I'm more aware now than ever I was before of the broad sweep of human talent and genius. Yeah? Once a scholar, we begin to think very narrowly of talent and genius. Very narrowly, yeah? Because does she know what a Hessian matrix is or whatever, like, kind of like that. That's, what is that, yeah? There are people who have seen a problem in the world and had the creativity, the foresight, the stick to itiveness, the get up off the ground when it doesn't go and fix it. Yeah? That's genius too. I've gotten to meet those people. They don't write papers for a living, but seeing them has helped me be a better leader and better paper writer when I'm able to write paper. That's what I would say. Yeah. It's a great advertisement for becoming a dean. <laughs> 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 Very balanced answer. Uh, Manuel, did you have a question? Uh, Caitlin, uh, at the front, please. Yeah, I'm Hold on. curious about the following. I mean, you were here in Miami, and you see this is a big city, and obviously the university is exposed to a big city. On the other hand, there are places like Cornell that are relatively smaller. Yes. So how different is to be a dean at Cornell and not in Miami, How, what sort of things Cornell would have to do that we don't do, or Miami would have to do that Cornell doesn't? Or Yale, where I am. Yes. Yeah, I would say that, um, look, every place has its peculiar charms, right? That there is, 
uh, Miami is one of the world's great cities. It's got this vibrant international and Indian. And so in terms of pitching to students, the idea that they could find enjoyment off campus, make discoveries in the wonderful community that hosts this city, there's less of a sale pitch, sales pitch that needs to be done. But I could envision, I can imagine that for some students, uh, being lost at sea in this big, wonderful city yeah, is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. When I got here, when I came here, I had whatever the thing is, less than zero money, that's what I had. Yeah. Whatever that thing is. So I, didn't, I couldn't go to the, my, I didn't do any of these things. Friends of mine would occasionally drive me, but I would think, I, I, it seemed so vast, so over, I couldn't enjoy it. And so alongside the possibility is, the, is the, the notion, the danger that some students might feel, as I said earlier, overwhelmed and out of place. There is an intimacy of the smaller town that is reassuring for some, not just at Yale, but other small college towns, where one gets up and walks from the apartment to the dorm. And there's a familiarity, there's an, a, an ease, there's a, a sense of not being at sea, yeah? What I learned a long time ago, everything comes with a price. And the price of that is there's not as many great fill-in-the-blank jazz clubs or empanada stores or whatever, yeah? Um, but that's what I would say. The university, the department, has to understand where it is, what its endowment is, where by endowment here I mean the city that surrounds it, surrounds it, the culture in which it sits, and organize its activities to be, to be consonant with that culture, to anticipate the problems that come with it, etc. Just as we have to do at Yale, much similar things must be done here at Miami. There'll be different things, but the problem you're highlighting is a problem that, that confronts every single university, because it's got its culture, which for good and bad reasons, which is good for some and bad for others, and it's got to be it must erect or select programs or to deal with the peculiarities of its culture. I hope that answers it. All right, I think we have time for one more if there's one last question. Um, I think appropriately, uh, Professor Robbins is going to have the final word, or not the final word, but the <laughs> penultimate word. I don't have a question, but I do have a recommendation for the audience. Um, since Kerwin was my student, um, I followed his career very closely. And there is an economist at the University of Chicago named Stephen Levitt who wrote Freakonomics. And he has a podcast called People I Most Admire in the World. And I listened to that podcast. And Kerwin, if you want to learn more about him, I highly recommend that you listen to the podcast when he had Kerwin Charles on. It really was very inspiring. Thanks. And I thank you for coming, and it's been great to see you. Oh, it just, just makes well, my whole year to see you. Let me add my thanks as well, and uh, you know, it was definitely worth the wait to have you here in person. So thanks for holding out for- uh, My pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah.